We, we've talked about the supply, uh, you know, the very strong demand, and we've talked about the supply or the likely increase in supply, we'll say that, of, of the exporting nations. But let's look, we'll say that, um, uh, because I actually think the real problem will be the supply of grain in grain uh, stroke rice in the existing main sort of consuming nations such as China and such as India and it's there we'll say that uh, that I think the biggest threat in terms of uh, uh, lies would say that uh, water and the availability of water would say that is going to limit food production in those countries in a never bigger way carrying forward let's take let's take China for sorry let's take India first and uh, the um, you know first of all its population is expected to grow from 1100 million to, to uh, 1590 million by 2050 the uh, I don't know whether it will happen, I'm sure it won't, we'll say, but that's the prediction. So, hugely increased demand. If you look, we'll say that um, zero in at one or two areas, just, we'll, take, uh, we'll just take a couple of situations. First of all, the main, the most fertile area in India is the Punjab. There's been free electricity and for pumping water for donkey's years. And we'll say free anything leads to excessive usage. And the aquifers in the Punjab are now falling very, very quickly. So in terms of stored water, the underground stores, they're depleting. But there's a second and a bigger threat also looming, we'll say, that um, the Ganges River uh, the, um, is a lar the, um, a rises... Uh, you know that a, a big part of its supply comes from the uh, the ice melt coming from the glaciers on the Himalayas. The Gangotri Gla Glacier, which is one of the biggest in the world, is it's actually shrinking by about 7% a year. So th think about this: the very, very heavy rains in Asia, winter rains, that now will say are captured as ice and we'll say that it's gradually released uh, in terms of the, the melt, the summer melt, and so that the Ganges, 70% of its flow during the summer, when you really need irrigation, comes from that ice melt, okay, 70%. So if we'll say the glaciers, as predicted by 2035, the, uh, the, this glacier, uh, uh, the, uh, and many other the Himalayan ones are just about gone. If that happens, the wind, heavy winter rains fall, race out to sea, causing damage, flooding, and everything else like that. And the Ganges probably would just about be dry in summertime. So, huge, huge, looming threat to, to food supplies worldwide. Uh, and uh, the uh, Asia. Uh, China and, uh, China and uh, the, uh, India are the two largest growers of wheat and rice. So anything that hits their ability to produce their own food is very serious. Switch now, we'll say, to China. And, uh, the, uh, and Ch China, will say, that has only about 25% of the water availability of the rest of the world. And, but when you break it down, we'll say, into the south of China, that's the Yangtze. And there's plenty, broadly, there's, there's a big problem with pollution of the Yangtze, but broadly there's enough water in that system. It's when you get to northern China that the problem kicks in. The, the Yellow River, which is their main river network, will say that it doesn't actually reach the sea more days than it reaches the sea. And that's already... That's, that's what's happening at the minute. The, uh, we'll say that um, the aquifers in northern China are dropping by five, six, seven feet a, a year. So, I mean, that there's a limit to how long you can keep doing this. And um, northern China is where two-thirds, a, a bit more than two-thirds of their crops are actually grown. And they're heavily dependent on irrigation China uses irrigation more than any other country worldwide. Once you haven't the water to irrigate, then we'll say that uh, the, uh, you know, the crop yields drop by more than 60%. Now, th that's the underground stores of water are depleting. Now, let's look at the overground stores. Uh, the glaciers, again, we'll say that coming uh, on the Tibet Qinghai uh, uh, glaciers 
are also depleting quite rapidly and are expected to be largely gone by 2060. Again, exactly the same thing trend as in, as in Asia, that, uh, as in India. If you, if you don't have a glacier supplying summer, summer ice melt, then we'll say that the, the Yellow River will not be available to irrigate for most of the time of the year when it need, you know, when, when it's really needed. So big, big problems emerging. At, um, and the serious enough, by the way, that um, no, this is coupled with that's just, we'll say, the demand for the, uh, you know, sort of the supply of water. That's coupled also if you go to China, as people move into cities, what actually happens? Flush toilets, showers and so on. In China, a person in a city uses about 10 times more water than somebody in the country. And as people have the means to pay for water, it's difficult to deny them. Water for industry is growing at a rate of about 8 to 10 percent a year. And so, as, in terms of China's industrialization and urbanization, it's creating more and more of a demand for water. So where will this water come from? And the, um, no, the, the, um, the, the Chinese are, I mean, they're very clever people, we'll say that uh, they're well aware of this threat. So they're bringing a canal, hugely expensive canal, from the Yangtze up to the Yellow River systems. But in terms of, if you look to 2030, the, the extra amount of water that they can bring in through this canal will be about one sixth of the extra water that they need for how, you know, for uh, cities and, uh, uh, and for industry. It's a serious problem by the way, two thirds of Chinese cities have regular water shortages of note, two thirds already. And the Chinese Minister for Water reckons that 40% of Chinese already do not have enough water consumption per day uh, and that people are at quite serious risk. So it's a big problem already. But when you think of, we'll say, this idea of where they're going to be in, say, 20, 30 or thereabouts, there will be an enormous shortage of water. And it can either only come from agriculture, and if it does, it's hugely at the expense of their crop yields. So they will, uh, the US estimates that by 2030, China will need to import the entire quantity of grain that's exported at the moment. And if they do that, what about the 200 other countries that actually import grain? So there's a huge imbalance coming in this sort of area. The, 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 um, there's always possible solutions, and it's interesting, and I haven't mentioned it in the paper because it's actually happened, uh, at least I've only become aware of it since I wrote the paper three months ago. The, the Chinese are now negotiating with the Russians to get access to water from Lake Becca a huge, huge a lake in Siberia. And it's over this kind of issue that, uh, the, uh, that I, I suspect that wars will be fought in the future because uh, the, uh, it'll be very, very interesting to see the result of that negotiation. And but generally, the picture is well, so that, uh, the, um, you know, that Ch India's ability to grow anywhere near as much food as it's growing at the moment will just will not exist within 10, 15, 20 years. So it, this is why I'm suggesting, as Peter Brabeck did, that the fixation on global warming is misplaced. The real imminent problem and certain problem for the human race is actually feeding itself. I tell you, yeah. So So I innovation uh, 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 and whatever, uh, a new technology, it may lead, and I hope it does, to prove me absolutely and utterly wrong. And uh, it's worth noting that the human race is most innovative, generally, when the need is greatest. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, but generally, the picture I'm painting is, we'll say, that uh, the, uh, you know, hunger, famine, major social unrest are very, very likely to increase and increase substantially. Uh, the, um, and Political instability, revolution, much more likely. Terrorism a fair, will have a fairly fertile breeding ground, and many wars will be fought this century over water, energy, uh, and food. So, the effects on milk price, the effects 
of we'll say more expensive energy and more expensive uh, the um, grain, it will be devastating on commodity, uh, sorry, on confinement, daring. And remember, that is most of the world's daring. It will be devastating unless they have, on average, a much higher price going forward than we'll say that uh, they had uh, prior to 06. Uh, and uh, the, uh, for New Zealand farmers, there are still risks. And next slide, please. It's, um, it, it's worth having a look in terms of what led to the, uh, you know, the, the rapid increase in prices in, um, in 07. If you actually look at the rundown of stocks, that stock change in 04, 05, 06, it's actually quite small. You know, uh, the, uh, about six, uh, a little over six million tons of stocks. Uh, the, uh, um, very quite small changes can have major effects on the world market. Could we move on, Paul? Uh, the, um, uh, yeah. So just really, it was the depletion of uh, U.S. and EU stocks. When stocks are exhausted, consumption in the short run cannot grow faster than supply. Can we move on? Uh, the, uh, and the, the, what I want you to take from this this slide is, we'll say that. Um, and the, you know that how small the world traded market is relative to total production. It's only seven or eight percent of total production. So you have the situation that somewhere like New Zealand, three percent of total production worldwide is 32 percent or so of, of the world traded market. But the risks, in particular, to, would say to um, to the market would come. We'll say that. Um, on the production side, would come as uh, from if you look at the EU, 25% of, um, of of world production, 31% uh, of the world market. The EU was 50 plus 50% of the world market before quotas. Since April, we'll say that uh, the um, EU quotas have been raised by 2%. It doesn't sound much, but it's 2% of 25% of the world's production. If that 2% is actually produced, it's about equivalent to 15% of New Zealand's production. So if the EU uh, actually produces this 2% that it's now allowed to do, if the EU farmers do, and the 1% that's projected each year, that will have a significant impact on world markets. It's actually quite a lot of milk in terms of a, a very small world market. And uh, the, So it's a big, big question. Will, that, will the EU actually produce that extra 2%. Personally, I don't think it will, but it's one of the things to watch out for going forward. Again, if you look at, um, uh, in terms of total production, the US, 15% of the uh, of total production, uh, but we'll say that 8% um, um, of the world traded market uh, in that year, which was 06. Uh, the, uh, some, something like about 10% uh, in 07. And the U.S. has come from being a tiny supplier onto the world market, only two or three percent, to about ten percent, and very, very quickly. So that the increase that the, uh, that has been happening in production in the U.S., if that continues, that will have a major impact. Is it likely to continue? Uh, the um, a particular ratio that the U.S. farmers are very responsive to is milk price to a feed grain ratio. And when that's favourable, milk production tends to increase pretty quickly. In the last two or three months, that particular ratio has turned very, very unfavourable. So if normal trends continue, we'll say that milk production should likely slow down in the States. But the, uh, these are the kind of risks on the production side. And so uh, they will... There will obviously be blips going forward, given it's the world traded market. It's such a small market that there will be occasional surpluses. But given the very high cost base of, in particular, EU farmers and US farmers, the, especially in this era of expensive grain and expensive energy, if low prices are maintained for any length of time, the high cost producers cannot sustain that and will go broke and will go broke very quickly in a less subsidised sort of uh, 
situation going forward. So I believe even when the uh, you know the market is flooded a wee bit, I think we'll say those blips will be quite short lived, and I think we'll say that uh, the uh, prices will recover pr very very quickly. So what's the message we'll say for New Zealand dairy farmers, grass based dairy farmers, and grass based dairy farmers anywhere? As long as we'll say that um, the people remember we'll say that the traditional strengths of New Zealand dairy and observe those absolutely excellent grassland management keep control that cost base and be, be careful in terms of not substantially overpaying for land then if people are mindful of those then I think the medium to long term outlook for New Zealand grass based dairy farmers is absolutely excellent thanks very much